Calling Jesus Lord by definition means in every way, in every place, in everything in your life. Is if he is not Lord of all, he is not Lord at all in your life. Take your Bibles and look with me this morning in the Gospel of Luke. We're going to be reading two stories in chapters 18 and 19. And you can probably guess uh, from the songs that Todd's been leading us in this morning that this message is going to have something to do about grace. And I do want to talk with you about the case for amazing grace. Now, these last couple of weeks, we've been doing this series leading up to Easter called The Journey to Jerusalem. And we are closing in on Jerusalem this morning. And so, we're going to read these two stories involving two different men that Jesus uses to teach this lesson about his wonderful grace. Again, if you want to stand in your homes while we're reading God's Word, feel free to do that. And we're going to start reading in verse 18 of chapter 18. It's a familiar story. Um, Matthew, Mark, and Luke all record this story and this event of the rich young ruler. So Luke says, and a certain ruler questioned Jesus, saying, Good teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Honor your father and your mother. And he said, all these things I have kept from my youth. And when Jesus heard this, he said to him, one thing you still lack. Sell all that you possess, distribute it to the poor, and you shall have treasure in heaven. And come, follow me. But when he heard these things, he became very sad, for he was extremely rich. Jesus looked at him and said, how hard is it? For those who are wealthy to enter the kingdom of God, for it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. And they who heard it said, then who can be saved? And Jesus said, the things impossible with men are possible with God. And Peter said, behold, we have left our own homes and followed you. And he said to them, Truly I say to you, there's no one who's left house or wife or brothers or parents or children for the sake of the kingdom of God who shall not receive many times as much at this time and in the age to come eternal life. And then in chapter 19, we began to see the story that you're also familiar with of Zacchaeus. Let's start reading in verse 1. And Jesus entered and was passing through Jericho. And behold, there was a man called by the name of Zacchaeus. And he was a chief tax gatherer. And he was rich. And he was trying to see who Jesus was. He was unable because of the crowd. And he was small in stature. And so he ran on ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree in order to See him, for he was about to pass through that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry, come down, for today I must stay at your house. And he hurried and came down and received him gladly. And when they saw it, they all began to grumble, saying, He has gone to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. 
And Zacchaeus stopped and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, half of my possessions I will give to the poor. And I, if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I will give back four times as much. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because he too is the son of Abraham. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. So on this journey to Jerusalem over the last few weeks, we have seen Jesus in Galilee and then leave Galilee and head south toward Jerusalem. Last week we saw him preaching in Perea, which is also referred to as Judea beyond the Jordan on the eastern side of the Jordan River. And this morning we come very close, just 10 miles outside of the city of Jerusalem. Now it's interesting that Luke records these two events, these two stories, almost back to back, separated by the story of Bartimaeus in, um, in Jericho receiving his sight. But he puts these two stories so close together to contrast the difference between these two men. It's a startling contrast about their nearness to God, a contrast of their status in society. One man is very religious, upstanding in the eyes of society, of those around him, well-respected. The other man, not so much. Although he too is rich, he's hated by society. He is a social outcast. Nobody loves him. He is hated by everyone around because he's a tax collector. Jesus uses these two encounters to teach about amazing grace. I love that song. John Newton a former slave trader, saved and turned minister, penned the words to that beloved hymn in 1772. Seven years later, the music that we still sing today was added to it. And since that time, it has become the most popular, the most recorded hymn in all of Christian history. Amazing grace. Now, one of my favorite renditions of Amazing Grace is by Celtic Woman. Now, these ladies are not nearly as talented as the Dubos family, but they do a great job singing this song. If you've never heard this before, I can't believe, uh, but if you haven't, Turn up the volume on your computer or your TV, whatever you're watching on. Buckle your seatbelt and get ready. If you have seen it before, you know you're about to be blessed. So let's watch and listen to Amazing Grace. So the question posed by these two men to Jesus that day, and questions that we need to be asking as well today, is how are we to approach God? How can we please God? How can we know God? How can we experience God's power in everyday life? Well, Jesus is going to use these two encounters to answer the questions, to give answers to these questions concerning his amazing grace. Now, I want us to look at each one of these men because they both represent, really, two different groups of people in society. Subject number one is what I call no grace required. We read in the story that this ruler, Matthew tells us he's a young ruler, young man, who is rich, who is respected by society, 
comes to Jesus. Now, we may get the idea that this was just a farce, that he was trying to trap Jesus, but in the Gospel of Mark, Mark actually tells us that he runs up to Jesus and kneels before him. I think there was something in his heart that was searching. He was looking. He was wanting to know how for sure he could approach God. But there's a couple of things that we notice about this particular gentleman in which he felt no grace was required. One, there was, there was kind of an entitlement to God's blessings. He kept the religious rules. He obeyed the commandments. So, in fact, God owed him. Now, that was the, that was the prevailing theology of the day. That if I'm wealthy... If I'm healthy, if I'm well respected, then it's because God recognizes that and God gives me what I'm due. So I have all of these blessings. On the other hand, if I'm not wealthy and if I'm not healthy, and especially if I'm not respected by society, it's obvious that God is not pleased with me and so God thus has left me to my own consequences. To be honest, in 2,000 years, we haven't changed much. That's still very much the theology of the day. That if something goes wrong, God must be attacking me. God's not happy with me. If I don't have a lot of wealth and a lot of toys then God's not blessing me and, and I'm, I'm in trouble with God. As we're going to see in just a moment, that's not always the case. Something else about this rich young ruler, and that was that he was a self-made man. When Jesus asked him what the commandments were and he named off several of those, commandments to not steal, not commit murder, not commit adultery, and to honor your mother and your father, we can almost see this young man proudly declare to Jesus, I've kept all those things from my youth, from my childhood until right now. Now, in all honesty, he probably didn't keep all those perfectly, but I imagine if we were to grab somebody on the street in Jericho that day and say, tell us about this young man, we would have probably gotten a good report that all of his life, he's even as a kid, he was well behaved. He stayed within the lines and he didn't cause trouble. He honored his mother and father. But there was a problem and Jesus recognized his problem. And the problem with this young man was that he compartmentalized his life. He obeyed God where he wanted to. But in other areas, he did what he wanted to. You know, it's interesting when Jesus asked him if he obeyed the commandments. And Jesus named off several of those commandments. Jesus didn't mention any of the commandments concerning his relationship to God because there was the problem. There was the problem. He didn't mention the commandments where God said, you shall have no other gods before me. He didn't mention the commandment that said, you shall have no idols, no graven images. Now, it wasn't so much a graven image, but this young man did have an idol, and his idol was money. An idol can be anything. It can be your job. It can be your recreation. It can be another person. It can be your own ego. It could be wealth. It doesn't have to be a little statue. 
An idol is just something that we set above God. And we basically are saying, God, I don't need you in this part of my life. I don't need you to interfere with my business. I don't need you to interfere with my recreation. I don't need you to interfere with my finances, God. I'm going to keep these compartments over here separate. I'll let you be God in my belief system. I'll let you be God on Sunday morning when I'm around my church family. I'll let you be God at certain times and in certain places. But I'm going to hold these these compartments to myself. I remember one of my great seminary professors talking about the lordship of Christ. And he told us, he said, always remember this. Calling Jesus Lord by definition means in every way. In every place, in everything in your life. Is if he is not Lord of all, he is not Lord at all in your life. And this was the problem with this rich young ruler. And Jesus, as he typically does, puts his finger right on the wound of his heart. He says, Here what you need to do. Go sell what you have, give it to the poor, and come follow me. Even the disciples misunderstood what Jesus was saying because they said, if this guy can't be saved, then who can be saved? We're shocked that subject number one is not okay with God. Jesus knew there was another God in his life, and that left no room for Jesus at all in the heart where no grace is required. But then we also see a story about subject number two. And I've entitled him, Only Grace Can Help. I mean, if you and I had been in Jericho in the first century and we were looking at Zacchaeus, we would have thought this guy doesn't have a chance. He is totally Someone whom God would not care about, certainly would not love, and for sure would not give him place in his kingdom. Subject number two, only grace could help, felt he didn't deserve to be in God's presence. He wanted to see Jesus, Mark tells us, or Luke tells us, but he's short. Zacchaeus was a wee little man. And so he couldn't see over the crowd. He couldn't get up to Jesus, but he wanted to see him. He didn't feel worthy to be in his presence. So what's he do? He, he shimmies up a tree. I mean, Zacchaeus literally was up a tree. Physically there in Jericho, but he was also up a tree when it came to his relationship with God. And unlike the rich young ruler, Zacchaeus had, he was dishonest. He was a social reject, that tax collector hated by the Jews and thought to be surely despised by God as well. Total opposite from the rich young ruler. However, There was one other characteristic about him that stood these two men apart, and that was Zacchaeus had the attitude that with all of my heart, all of my life is open to God's will. He looks at Jesus. As soon as Jesus recognizes him, says, come on, Zacchaeus, get down out of that tree. I've got to go to your house today. It's interesting that Jesus uses the The word, the imperative, I must go to your house today. We might ask the question, why was Jesus so insistent about going to his house? 
This was the last time Jesus would be in Jericho. In fact, he was leaving Jericho. He was on his way out of town. He would never see Zacchaeus again this side of heaven. Zacchaeus probably would never have another opportunity to come to Christ. It was the 11th hour and 59th minute for Zacchaeus in his relationship with God. And Zacchaeus looked at Jesus and he said, in essence, I'm giving you my heart. I'm giving you my life. I'm not going to compartmentalize my life. In fact, I'm going to give away half of what I have to the poor. And those that I've cheated, I'm going to pay back four times to them what I cheated them. It was already on his mind. Zacchaeus was burdened. He was broken by his sin and his disobedience to God. And he had no way, no expectation of, of pleasing God based on his merit or based on his actions. No, Zacchaeus truly was a guy that only grace could help. And Jesus looked at Zacchaeus and he says, today, salvation has come to this, this house. Again, what a contrast. From the rich young ruler when confronted with the fact that he had other gods in his life, walked away sorrowful. Walked away rejected by God. Zacchaeus, who had no social standing, who had no social merit, and as far as we know, probably wasn't a religious man, today finds grace from Almighty God because he humbles his heart before Jesus. Well, in these two stories, Jesus makes clear for us what grace can do. First of all, he visibly shows us that grace cannot be earned, can't be purchased, and it's not deserved. These were all the reasons why the rich young ruler felt like he was good with God. And God should accept him because he's such a great guy. And he does all of the right things. Many of us today, maybe some of you watching this live stream, feel like I've got to be good with God because I'm a moral person. I'm a kind person. In the middle of this pandemic, I'm... I'm trying to help my neighbors. I'm trying to help others. God ought to accept me. But it's all by amazing grace, not anything that we can do to earn it or merit it or deserve it. It's all by God's free grace. Another thing Jesus shows those living in Jericho, and he shows us today, is that grace is the only means to God's life. The rich young ruler walked away spiritually dead. Zacchaeus walked away born anew into God's family. And Jesus said these words. He said, Today, salvation has come to this house because he too is a son of Abraham. Jesus wasn't talking about his racial lineage, that he was a Jew. So he was a descendant of Abraham. Jesus was talking about the spiritual birth that happened in his life. He belonged to God now. He was a son of God, just like Father Abraham, because of his faith in Jesus Christ. And there's one other lesson that we desperately need to know in this day, in this hour, and that is that God's grace is the daily need for all of us in every hour of life. 
We don't just receive God's grace once on the day that we come to know Christ, but just as we received grace that day, we need God's grace every day. We need God's grace right now to have courage. We need God's grace right now to have peace. We need God's grace right now to have the strength to minister to others, to help others who may not have that strength and may not have that peace. The Apostle Paul in the book of 2 Corinthians talks about to the church at Corinth about what his life as a Christian, what his life as an apostle, what his life as, a, as an evangelist missionary was like. If he wrote it down on a resume, he'd never be called to a church because he talked about being imprisoned, he talked about being stoned, he talked about being beaten. We look at Paul and we think, man, this guy, God's really got it in for him because he's, he's put, putting him through the mill. Again, in today's theology, oh, you trust God, you trust Jesus, and you're going to be rich. You're going to be happy every day. You're going to have all sorts of material blessings. Paul said, no, not for me, not for many others who committed their lives to Christ. And Paul said, it was God's grace that saw him through. God's grace is still real today. We need that daily grace. You remember John Newton? An amazing grace. The third verse of that song is one that that speaks to us right now. Newton writes and says, Through many dangers, toils, and snares, I have already come. His grace has brought me safe thus far, and grace will see me home. God's grace, God's grace is going to see us through this time and other times to come. He'll see us through that final breath when we leave the realms of this world And we step into the halls of heaven. It's God's great, amazing grace. Would you pray with me right now? I just want to ask you, I don't know who's watching this live stream, but I want to ask you right now, have you experienced God's amazing grace? Do you know Jesus Christ in your heart? Are you depending on your behavior to make you right with God? Are you depending on your morals or your good deeds to earn you a home in heaven? Jesus tells us that'll never get us there. It's only as we experience God's grace through his son, Jesus Christ, who died and rose again for us, that we can know that promise, that assurance of eternal life. If you've never come to that place where you just prayed to God and said, God, only grace can help me. I can't make my life right. I can't correct the mistakes that I've done. Only grace will help. Just like Zacchaeus. Come to him right now. Right there in your living room, your your kitchen table, wherever you are watching this live stream and, and just say, God, I need your grace. Oh, how I need your grace today. Forgive me. And accept me today, just like I am. Maybe you're watching 
this live stream and this pandemic is really, really attacking your life. There have been some, even in our church, that it has attacked their body. And you say, Lord, I'm in the middle of trials and troubles. And I need your grace. Listen, dear brother or sister. Whenever we ask God for another portion of his grace, he never says no. He never says no. When we walk through the fires, God joins us. When we're thrown into the lion's den, God sends his angels. His grace is ever ready for my life and for yours. Don't be afraid. Don't be panicked. Don't be anxious. Just reach out to him right now and say, Lord, give me that grace Pastor Jay's talking about. I need it today. So I want to pray with you. And while I lead us in prayer, you just reach out to God and say, God, work in my heart today. Father, I thank you so much for your amazing grace. And Jesus, in the last days of his life, are teaching his disciples it's all about grace it's not about your self-righteousness it's not about your goodness it's certainly not about your wealth it's whether or not we've received his grace and we've submitted ourselves to him as Lord and Savior of our lives Father, I pray for those who may be watching today who have never made that commitment to Jesus. And I pray right now they would open their heart and just say, Lord, pour your grace into my life. Only grace will help me. And God, as they do that, I pray you'd give that confirmation, give that awareness of your promise your sure covenant that whenever we open our hearts to you whenever we commit our lives to the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord of our life that you pour out that grace upon us that gift of life eternal and Father I pray for those this morning that are suffering from the virus, suffering from social isolation, just suffering from the overwhelming load of bad news that we hear every day, sickness and death, financial crises. God, I pray right now that your grace would flood their heart. Lift them. God, lift them out of this quagmire of pestilence that we're in today. Focus our eyes on your great grace that you've poured out in our lives. God, we love you. We thank you that you are here with us. Magnify your name in all of our lives.